I gotta tell you, I love stories like our next one. I had the chance to interview one of the nicest guys in music. He's the equivalent of that children's story, The Little Engine It Could. Technically, you only had one hit. It was one of those rare songs where the song's title is actually never said in the song. He was a small town guy who went to New York and made it in music. The song came out, you know, at the wrong time when his type of music was out of style. But this song broke through on the charts, and the mystery girl that this song is about, it's never been revealed. See if he'll tell me in the interview who it's about next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember sending away for something through the mail as a kid, and that six to eight weeks for delivery, what I always said in the fine print, it felt like two years. You're going to dig this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure you subscribe below right now. Click the red button. Click the bell so you always know when our stuff's coming out. Uh, also, check us out on Patreon. We just put up a couple of full interviews there. That helps us keep it a daily channel and check out our merch below. So it's time for another edition of our series, Bottle Lightning. It's where we celebrate a song or album that was king for a day, or many days. Here we honor artists and bands that rocketed up the charts, but for reasons unknown weren't able to sustain that success. Uh, but called by some as one-hit wonders, you know, we celebrate them here instead as a lightning in a bottle. Previous episodes we've covered at Broken Wings by Mr. Mister. Take these broken wings. Wishing Well by Terrence Rand Darby. She Drives Me Crazy by Fine Young Cannibals. We cover albums and songs. Today, I'm gonna to get right into the interview that uh, I did. Very interesting. It's an artist that everyone called the next Dylan. He had a lone top 10 hit in 1979 that he wrote about a girl. For decades, he's kept the mystery girl a secret. Meet me in the middle of the day, let me hear you say everything's okay. Well, a top 20 hit around the world, Romeo's Tune, went to number eight in Canada, number 10 in South Africa, 13 in Australia, and went to a number 11 here in America on the Billboard Hot 100. It's one of those songs that over time has attracted so much attention, pop culture, different things. It's one of those songs where the title is not in the lyrics. How did you make the correlation to the, the classic Romeo character as the name of the tune? Where did that come from? I was always curious. Well, obviously, it, it was a love song and a super quote-unquote romantic thing. And the next thought was Romeo's tune. Bring me southern kisses from your room. I didn't want to call it Meet Me in the Middle of the Day. But, you know, the, would you then have to say meet me, parentheses, meet me in the middle of the night? I mean... Right. I, I just called it Romeo's Tune because that seemed like what could be a good title objectively for the song. Meet me in the middle of the night, let me hear you say everything's all right. Not the best marketing move, I'll admit, but okay. <laughs> well, something that sticks in your head for sure. Let me smell the moon in your perfume. Oh. You were almost finished with the song by the time you came out with your debut album, but you decided against completing the track for that LP because it didn't fit the overall vibe of the debut. Is that right? Tell me about that. That is right. Alive on Arrival was, um, I never saw it as just a pop effort. It, it was always in my mind going to be fairly autobiographical, mm -hmm. folk kind of uh, folk rock record, acoustic record. And uh, I picked a very good producer for that, just the right person at the right time, who was Steve Berg, who was active in Greenwich Village. And I, I ran into him, where, you know, just very pretty easily that we would connect. We connected pretty easily. So Alive on Arrival was not going to want – Romeo's tune would have been out of place on there. I'm glad I didn't put it on there. Uh, the, you can have a song, you can have a really good song, but it is not necessarily a hit that's going to reach people on the radio yet. You know, that is a um, complete requirement is getting the right 
it's to use the word the right product as a record company would refer to it. Right. So I didn't want that on a live on arrival because that was the kind of the tale of the kid comes to New York City and that's what I was living and that's what I was focused on. I knew exactly what um we recorded a lot of things to be honest, but I was very comfortable with what wound up on that record. It was telling that story. You know, basically even literally with songs like Grand Central Station, March 18th, 1977. I mean, that's pretty literal. And I played guitar. Other songs such as Midsummer Night's Toast were very representative of my world. I'm waiting for lightning and the rain to fall. Wow, the joyful piano arrangement is so infectious in Romeo's tune. I had the figure, but when I showed the session pianist Bobby Ogden in Nashville, what there with John Simon, what what I what the song was, uh, he's a great piano player. He played Fender Rhodes in Elvis's band at, near the end. Oh, uh, there's some great stuff on Bobby Ogden on YouTube, uh, very uh, informative. But anyway, so that's where he went with the voicings and being a, a excellent pianist. He he really brought my rudimentary riff to life. I don't think anybody could have played it better. How did you get con connected with Bobby? How'd that happen? Is that through the label? Well, this would take you back to that session that was already booked and waiting for us, which John Simon plugged into and took the reins on at the last minute. So when when John Simon and, and Paul Errico, my touring keyboard player who played Hammond organ, uh, um, when we flew to Nashville and then the next day we went to Quad Recording Studio, we got in there and the the, the players that were waiting for us were the A-team, a yeah. uh, mu mus so-called Music Row, guys that made all the records and they were a little too good for my taste they they were you know they they the, these were guys that could they could play these sessions in their sleep and so it's in the book but i had to tell john simon i wasn't really comfortable with these guys so that gave him a problem right off the bat you know uh he's trying to work with these guys and now he's got to tell them they're quite possibly fired <laughs> Why? Because this cheeky kid, you know, thinks you're too good. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what they said? They, When John mentioned it to them, and he was nervous about it, but they said, you know, we agree. You know, this, this kid's energy is just, this is different from what we usually do week in and week out, day after day. But we, there's the, the next wave of players, we, we know who they are. And we'd like to recommend this list of players to come in and do this. They'll, they'll be better for this. And they're more of his age group and everything. And so we said, well, that John Simon said, great. That's, that's pretty painless. Nobody's really offended here. Yeah. You know, terrific. And they, those guys were kind and they said, you don't even have to pay us because we were obligated. It was booked. So to, they said, hire, the, hire these people. We know them. We like these guys, as I just said, and 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 you don't have to pay us. We're we're fine. Right. We'll go. We'll go away. Um, and good luck. So it it worked out that way, and 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 so Adam, I guess Bobby Ogden would be among the ones they recommended, although he was pretty established, as you can tell by then. Uh, this was seventy nine. Elvis passed away. What was it? August sixteenth, seventy seven. So. So anyway, that's what happened, and, and, and Bobby Ogden wound up on the record, which, of course, I'm glad. I also understand you tried to recording it in a, a few different studios as well. That's right. Uh, we did record it in Nashville, and we, we, we didn't feel we got it. We, we had a lot of high hopes for the song, 
it's not one of those cases where you you some I'm, you've heard many times people say we didn't think anything of smoke on the water we just tacked that on at the end we recorded that in about an hour or whatever you know but this wasn't that we were deliberately going for the single for to get on the radio and that would make everybody involved happy but then we we said okay let's try it when we go back to new york city and we we did that and it it completely flopped uh john simon and i booked some players we knew of around manhattan it, it wasn't right at all and furthermore it wouldn't have matched what we'd already done and so john and i decided well we're 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 going to keep going on this. Let's let's go back to Nashville. How soon can we go back? And that's when we um that's when we wound up working with Roger Clark, a different drummer than the young drummer we'd already worked with, who did in fact play on half of the album. Uh his name was Gunnar Jalot. Oh, God to But he wasn't available or something that fast. And, and we, uh, this cat from Muscle Shoals, Roger Clark, was there. Uh, we, we asked him to play drums. He was recommended. And uh, that was a really good thing. His, his feel was real close to my Meridian, Mississippi feel, I, I would say. So that's some of the way the puzzle came together. Lost in talk, I waste my time, and it's all been said before. Engineer Gene Eichelberger, he was a big part of of, uh, of making that final version of Romeo's tune come to life, right? Tell me about that. The first two records I recorded totally live, no overdubs whatsoever. That was a difficult rule to enforce with some of the players, but that was the rule. And it served me well. Um so there you have it. When we were recording at the Quad Studio in Nashville, it was totally live. And um, Gene had been recommended, I guess, as part of that A-team, Adam. You know, the first wave of people we encountered in there that were, quote unquote, too good. But Gene remained. That was okay. The engineer wasn't too good. He wasn't really playing anything. But he was damn sure recording it. And uh, Gene was so good. He's he's renowned. And and John Simon was enthusiastic about it. He knew who Gene Eichelberger was. And uh, Gene got so good at just recording these things and straight off the floor as we did them in there. That was that's what he did anyway. But when we went in to listen to the final version of the 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 one that the single of Romeo's tune, I just thought on the spot it sounded fine. And so I just said, hey, let's make a, a quarter-inch tape copy of this as is. And Gene ran one off, and then we moved on to a couple of other songs that day. But we never, I, I felt we would never top that rough mix because, like you said a minute ago, it it just, it, it the piano sounds so vibrant from the very beginning. Oh, yeah, yeah. And these these things matter. So, oh, um, sure. you know, um, you can mix a record all day, but you very well might go too far. Yeah, yeah. And I just thought this seemed like it was already there. And and so that's the record you hear is the what Gene Eichelberger created on the spot with those players and myself. It's King, Queen, and we must go down now beyond the chandelier. Background singers. Yeah. Masterful nuance. Brought by the Shoals sisters. That's Davis correct. And Marie. The people have asked you to divulge the name of the person that you had uh, those romantic feelings for in Romeo's tune, but you've you've never answered that. And I won't ask you to break your silence here, but okay. your words were inspired by a real person that you deeply cared for. Yeah, that I had a major crush on. It's just <laughs> like this what well, that's what you hear in the song. Yeah. I was recently uh, disappointed to have Paul McCartney elaborate on Eleanor Rigby wearing a face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Eleanor Rigby, 
Picks up the rice in the church where a wedding. That was good enough for me for decades. What yeah. what what did it mean? Well, yeah. no need to really know. Uh, make up your own meaning or just go with it. Uh, you know, and he recently said something, it clarified what it was literally about, and it explained everything, and I wish he hadn't. So I, I completely agree with you. Wearing the face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Yeah. I think you should take it to the grave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the song's been used extensively in pop culture, especially in film. Bad Manners in 97, Knock Around Guys in 2001. <laughs> Romantic comedy, uh, Margo at the Wedding, 2007, I believe that came out. Everybody Wants Him that came out a few years back. It's very cinematic, you know, and I think it should be used even more. Bring me southern kisses from your room. Hey. All these years later, what are your final thoughts on that song as, as we move forward to other songs? I don't have any problem with it. I've said that many times. It's not just a stock answer. The, the lyrics are fine. They travel through the decades with me. There's not anything regrettable about it. I sing it every night, maybe <laughs> once in a while. I, I There was a while when I might just perversely not sing it, or if I had that much faith in a particular audience, if you will, that I don't have to do it tonight. They're fine, but it's not smart. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I quit that. But I, I still sing it every show then I would say, and it's 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 always fun. I'd like to spend some time before I let you go discuss your 2022 release, Moving Through America. Song Fried Oysters. I gotta ask you about that, where you sing about a couple going, you know, out on the town to enjoy some fried oysters. I won't eat fried oysters with a very much a slice of life, but I love that. Tell me about that. All there is to it is that I actually really do like fried oysters a lot. <laughs> I don't blame so, you. So there you go. I just got into the process of writing a song about it. And it became a story of a guy waiting on his girlfriend to get ready and waiting and waiting. And, um, you know, take your time and show me I'm in too much of a whirl. And, and there you go. Of course, being a singer-songwriter, I had to get into some more serious areas, you know, call it depressing if you like. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I did get into the verse about uh, placing it in Houston and, and then being worried about what's the next hurricane going to do. Because it was right after that hurricane, it, you know, really flooded the whole flat town. So uh, that there you have it. The, but the, the, that's kind of what I, I do is just to take the uh, people say the commonplace and, and make a song out of them. But that's that's where I live. What's the next big hurricane gonna do? Well, what's next? What, what are you working on now? More songs. Uh, slowly demoing the songs, which is a really fun process. I'm at it with Steve Greenwell. And that is happening. As we've discussed, uh, Streets of This Town is being represented, has been remixed, and that's coming out in June. And not face one more day on the streets of this town. So, and, and that would, all of this would also involve more shows, still doing duo shows and some band shows. So they're all booked for the, the shows are booked for the summer. Yeah. So keep at it, still going. But uh, that's what I like to do is just to be challenged with the songwriting thing. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Steve Forbert and this bottle lightning classic from 1979, Romeo's Tune. What do you remember about the song? What are some other bottle lightning classics, one hit wonder from the 60s, 70s, and 80s that you'd like us to cover, or even the 90s? Let us know below. Let's have a great discussion. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.